Hello, everyone. Welcome to the topology optimization webinar. Uh, today, this session is dedicated to topology optimization of flow-based problems. It is organized by Joy Alexanderson from University of Southern Denmark. Thank you, Joe, for organizing this session. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Jun. And thank you, everyone, for coming today. So I just put together a very brief introduction here. Uh, so yeah, today is going to be all about flow-based problems, so fluid-based problems. And uh, we have some nice presentations here today. Just briefly uh, on me, if it works. Yeah, yeah. So I'm an assistant professor at the University of Southern Denmark. And uh, I've been working with topology optimization of flow-based problems for some years now. So uh, I'll just be giving an a short introduction here. So actually more or less exactly one year ago. So one year minus four days, Casper uh, and I published our review paper on topology optimization for fluid-based problems. And I'm just gonna briefly gonna be taking an, a, an outset from this to give you a introduction here. So if we look at the number of papers that was published since the first paper in 2003, up until we submitted our manuscript, which was January 2020, we had 186 papers and we could see that the papers per year is uh, was steadily increasing. Um, so we had about 36 in 2019. So I just did a quick overview, not very exhaustive, but uh, I got 36 for 2020, which seems a little bit low. So I probably didn't do a good enough job of uh, checking out here, but we actually already have 17 from 2021. Um, but I think here, I, I actually remembered that the categorization we did in the paper, we did based on the online first date. So some of these from 2021 are probably published online in 2020 and then just have their publication issue in 2020. But either way, it seems to be going in the right direction with more and more research on this uh, subject here. So we just briefly on the different design representations. So we all know there are different ways of doing topology optimization. If we look at these flow-based problems, we see that uh, the vast majority is uh, using the density-based approach. And then the second biggest is level set, and that's probably quite uh, common to, to all of topology optimization. And then we have some other uh, methods here. So today we actually have uh, three density and one then that's using a body fitted representation, which is Florian who will talk more about that. But that actually reflects this sort of uh, uh, percentage uh, pretty good. If we look at the problem type, so the largest group was uh, pure fluid problems. So that's just flow problems, minimizing the dissipated energy, minimizing pressure loss uh, or other different things, uh, creating manifolds and, and, and stuff. But if we have pure fluid problems, that was uh, more or less 44%. And then the next big group is conjugate heat transfer. That, so that's where we have solid heat transfer that is coupled to the heat transfer and fluid motion in a, in a surrounding fluid. And today it's actually going to be four conjugate heat transfer presentations, um, which is where a lot of things are, are happening uh, this year and last year. Finally, just an overview of what we, we have today. So we start off with Xi Cheng Sun, and then we go on to Sheng Li. Casper, and then we end off with Florian and Fipon. So the first two here, we are looking at sort of design of cooling channels. And then the last two are two fluid uh, heat exchanger problems. So uh, with that, uh, I think we should go on to the first presentation. Uh, so Si Cheng, if you share your screen. And then you have 15 minutes. So if you unmute yourself. Unmute. There you go. We can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, sure. Yes. Okay. So let me go to the screen. So hello everyone, today I'm going to share a work on the 
a three-dimensional topology optimization of his things for liquid cooling. My name is Sun, and here are the courses, Peter and uh, Professor Chen. Uh, we are from the University of Wisconsin Medicine. Uh, firstly, the introduction. So nowadays, the electronics are getting more and more smaller. However, the power density are greater and greater. And this is why you, I think, one reason why you see a lot of papers are published uh, uh, in this area recently. Uh, and however, conventional he thinks face the, the restrictions of dissipating more heat uh, while consuming less energy. So here is the panel plate he think. Uh, there is a Pareto front for the pellet. For the pellet uh, he think, uh, there is a barrier. And uh, what we wish is to break through this barrier. So towards your optimization methods, uh, combining with the additive manufacturing, show the potential to break through this barrier. Uh, the design problem we studied is like this. Uh, we put a sink in this, in this box. We have in it alternate extension. Uh, and uh, in order to save the computational time, uh, we just assimilate one cut of this for his sink with a symmetric boundary con uh, condition on the two sides. We have the heat comes through the bottom surface from the red surface. So the problem we defined as this uh, objective function is to minimize the average temperature on that heat flux surface and uh, subject it to the two governing equation. One is the Navier-Stokes equation. One is the energy equation. For, and uh, we have another constraint on the fluid energy dissipation. It's a volume integration. You may also have a pressure drop constraint, which you can integrate on the inlet and the outlet surface. So for the Navier-Stokes equation, we have a additional term which can mix the, the solid and the fluid part together uh, the, through the Brickham friction term. Uh, if gamma equal to zero, we, which represents the solid phase, uh, this friction will be pretty huge. And uh, this can make sure that the velocity in the solid phase is close to zero. And if gamma equal to one, which is the fluid phase, this, equation, this friction will vanish and this equation will return to the Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, our optimization process. First, we put the initial gamma, pass two filter. One is the PD filter, one is the heavy side filter. And then we use the filtered density field gamma, uh, gamma theta or gamma hat to solve the governing equation, the Navier-Stokes equation, and the energy equation. We then solve the adjoint equation. With the adjoint equation, we can compute the sensitivity. However, this sensitivity is with respect to this filtered density field. And we need to compute the sensitivity with respect to the gamma. We can update this gamma based on the sensitivity with the optimizer, MMA, and then we see this updated gamma, whether it converge or not. If yes, we output the result. If not, we then update this gamma and do this process again. So for the Navier-Stokes equations, uh, which is always the key in the flow-related flow optimization problem, because it takes a lot of computational costs. Uh, and the Navier-Stokes equations, we discretize it with the equal order element for the velocity and the pressure, which can save some of the computational cost. We use the SUPG and PSPG stabilization uh, for this equal order elements. And uh, we also solve a continuous consistent adjoint equation, uh, which, which take this stabilization into consideration. The state equation and uh, its adjoint equations are solved with the PCD pressure convection diffusion preconditioner. 
the preconditional help us to get this equation converged faster and better. Uh, the solvers are implemented with the open source software Phoenix and with the finite method. Uh, our platform for the computing is the Amazon EC2 machine with 96 CPUs. Uh, the whole domain discretized into 6.4 million tetrahedral cells and the uh, approximate speed for each optimization iteration uh, varies from 20 minutes to 60 minutes. And uh, in order to get one design, uh, the full time is around two weeks, actually less than two weeks. Here's the TO result we get. Uh, you can see this is metric boundary. We have in it and uh, this side is out in it. This is the sort structure we have. Uh, we converted it also to a geometric model for some forward analysis. We have an uh, animation for the design. Okay, so here we show the design for the left side. Uh, and we also cut it in the middle to show the inside. Uh, we can see there are some segregated fins here. Uh, in the upstream, there is a disconnected big solid piece on the top. And we also have some plate fin formed on the bottom, uh, on the downstream, sorry, on the downstream. And uh, the shape is not straight plates, it's like bended towards the middle of the of the plane. Uh, we observe some cooling mechanisms uh, by investigating the 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 thermal flow. So this is the the streamline and uh, which we show the temperature on the streamline. Uh, you can see the first mechanism is the flow split effects. Uh, you can see that when the cold flow enters this uh, region, a lot of the flow, cold flow on the bottom layer, which are closer to the heat surface, uh, is, is, is warmed and uh, then it will be sent to the top layer, which are away from the heat flux surface in the downstream region. And uh, in the upstream region, there will remain some cold flow uh, and they will be sent to the, down, uh, to the bottom layer in the downstream region, which are closer to the heat flux surface to take away more heat. We zoom in this area for better uh, regionization here. We zoom in here. So in region A and region B, you can see a lot of hot flow are sent to top layer through the surface of the fin. And also through this surface, the, the hot flow are sent to top. And uh, the place will be took over by the cold flow from upstream. And they, they will go to the bottom layer in the downstream region to take away more heat. Uh, the second uh, mechanism we observe is the reinitialization of the boundary layer. Uh, so when the fluid go to touch this solid thing, for example, here and also here, uh, you can see from its upstream, the fluid should get hot. hot. However, uh, some of the cold flow will take over the place to to contact with the solid thing, uh, which reinitiates the boundary layer. And uh, because of this cold flow, the boundary layer is reinitialized and more heat are taken away. Otherwise, if this green is, uh, meets the solid thing, it will turn like yellow and the dark orange, which means the temperature are getting higher and higher. Because of this reinitialization, the temperature will be kept in a low temperature. Five minutes. 
Uh, we also observed uh, a flow split effect, which we mentioned previously in the 2D figure. You can see there are a lot of code flow with blue color sent to the uh, bottom layer of the, of the channel in the downstream region. So we compared the TL design with the panel plates. We mentioned previously in the introduction, we want to break through the barrier. And uh, we observe that with the TO design here, actually, if they have the same pressure drop with the uh, optimized uh, panel plates, the temperature will be lower. If they have the same uh, same same temperature, the pressure drop will be lower. Based on how much it's lower. Uh, the next we come we pick it one of the panel plate thin he think on the Pareto front. I think this design to compare with the TO design with different pumping power. So the pumping power is that uh, it's equal to the flow rate times the pressure drop. So we gradually increase the flow rate and uh, plot the average temperature versus the pumping power. The red curve is the TO design. The blue one is the picket Parallel plates, thin heat sink. And uh, you can see the TL design shows better and better performance than the panel plates, thin heat sink. Uh, we compare the surface area between these two designs. The surface area are measured in fluence. So uh, for per one centimeter width in this direction, the parallel plates surface area is actually much higher than the TO design. So this is uh, in contrast to the optimization without considering the Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, in the heat conduction optimization, we always see some tree type structures which increase the surface area. However, this TO design actually beats these parallel plates by better convection rather than conduction. So here is our conclusion. First, uh, uh, we prove that topology optimization method is a viable and effective computational design tool for the heat sink design. And compare our TO design with the optimized uh, PF heat sink, uh, the TO design uh, uh, show less temperature when the pump, when the pressure drop is same, and also show less pressure drop when the temperature is same. So we also observed some interesting cooling mechanisms automatically emerged from the TO, uh, which need to better hit this patient. This is the paper. Now for the appendix, we show some recent work of our group. Firstly, is the experiments. We want to test uh, experimentally whether this heat sink compared with the panel plate, how much is better. This is the printed TO design with the DLMS method and uh, outside share, and then uh, TO design and the share sample together for testing. Other is the appendix. Appendix is the static mix. What move this up? I think the title is blocked. So this is static mixes. So we have some particle from this inlet, and we want a wear mixing from the alternate surface. It's, you can see it's not mixed uh, very well. Uh, for this problem, we design some structure in this zone, in this gray zone. We have some structure like this, and uh, in the alternate, you can see it's almost green, meaning that the mixing performance is much improved. Actually, it's improved by 90%, uh, however, pressure with 2.5 times pressure drop, higher pressure drop than the open channel, than this open channel. Okay. So this is the end of the presentation. Uh, any questions? Great, thanks a lot. You Thank hit you. the spot perfectly. So uh, I forgot to say before we started that, so we have 15 minutes presentation and then five minutes for questions where you can either speak up or put up your hand and speak up afterwards, or you can write a, a question in the chat. So, so 
I'll just go to one of the written ones, I guess. First off here. So uh, does the flow velocity affect the generated topology of the heat exchanger? Flow velocity, I think, yes. Actually, we in this study, we just uh, showed the, uh, the design on the one Reynolds number, on, on the 100 Reynolds number. So it's just a, a certain Reynolds number. And uh, for some other research we have done, for example, for this testing, we have different Reynolds number there and we see different structures. Yeah. They share yeah. some similarities, of course. However, the designs will be different. Apropos, so we have another question. What is the Reynolds number for the design that you have here? Uh, here is 100 with the nominal assumption. Okay, yeah. So I think we also have Ahmad with a live question here. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. Regarding your SUPG stabilization, what mm -hmm. was the range of flow rate that you checked and you see that the uh, the SUPG could actually remove the disturbance from the solution. Did you check it for different flow rate? Uh, we, 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 sorry, uh, good questions. Uh, we actually did not do that. The SUPG stabilization is added because actually uh, we want to add the PSPG stabilization. And uh, with that, we add both SUPG for we, because we need this PSPG for equal the elements, and then we use SUPG. We so, not, yeah. what was the range of your fill rate? Could you comment about that in this uh, simulation? Oh, my yeah. range of flow rates. Uh, yeah. You 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 mean like for here the maximum uh, maximum velocity, right? Yes. Uh, I, uh, the number, so if the unit is 100, I think the, uh, you can compute a mean velocity there and the maximum will be two or three times of the, of the, of the, uh, actually it's four times of the mean velocity around that number. And yeah, I did show the number directly. Yeah, sorry, sorry for that. Okay, thank you. So we have quite a number of questions. So let's try to do a few more. So we have the question, uh, have the experimental results uh, that you mentioned at the end, did they confirm your very interesting results? Okay, oh, gosh. Yes, uh, so what's the, what's the question for? Did, did the experimental results confirm uh, your simulations? Oh, uh, we are actually doing the simulation. Uh, we're doing the experiments now, and okay. uh, just, yeah, there will not be that much of information for now. Okay, yeah. Uh, then we're moving to more the numerical side here. So we have a question on how many uh, number of iterations did the linear solver use? So with the PCD preconditioner. Uh, with with this one, uh, PCD here. So uh, in the beginning, and also this, I think varies uh, at the, with the Darcy number. So in the beginning, it's Darcy number 10 to minus four. So iteration will be around 200, 200. And uh, uh, in the end, it will be around like uh, 600, 800, depending on. Also, I think because the, uh, in the beginning, the geometry is more uniform, right? So it's a uniform density. Yeah. Uh, in the end, the, the fluid and the sun is split, and uh, which make the problem harder to converge. So that will increase right. three or four times in the end. Yeah. So what, uh, which linear solver do you use? I use the uh, clean up subspace, the FGMRS. Okay, yeah. Yes. Right, we have uh, another live question from Sheng Da Yao. You can go ahead. Uh, yes, and unmute. I, I, I have a, a question. So, um, uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, uh, my question is that uh, at the starting point, uh, when we want to check our optimization method, if it can work uh, successfully, um, but you know, the 
the computation may take much time. So at the starting point, if we can use a you know very coarse mesh to check uh, whether the filter uh, parameter or the other setting can work, uh, like how you check if your method can work. Okay, good question. So actually, this this is the problem I I also met in my study. So uh, I did a lot of examples be before I get before I finally get this one. And uh, uh, in in this study, I need to study whether the parameters are correct and uh, like you mentioned, the filter size. Uh, and whether the sensitivity is correct, those things. So I, yes, I did a lot of example on the course match uh, with around eight, eight CPU and, uh, and uh, design freedom is around uh, 10,000, 20,000, 100,000, around that number. So I may not be able to get a very good design. However, I can plot the costs with respect to the iteration, and I can compare, uh, I can plot the constraints whether it kind of <clears throat> be restricted to to what I want, and uh, uh, to see whether this curve are smooth or not. If if you see some oscillation, you you may know that there might be some problems there. If the curve are smooth, convergence curve are smooth, and if the design are somehow meaningful. And then you can trust your design and maybe try the example with large uh, design variables and with more CPUs. Yes, thank you. Go Great, thanks. So that is all we have now. So we have some time at the end where we can come back to have more discussion. So let's move on. Uh, thank Xi Cheng soon again here. And then we move on to the, on next, to presenter. the next presenter. So, Shingi, so if you Shingi, can, if you share, can your share your screen. screen. Uh, so, can you see the screen? Uh, yes, now I do. Okay. So, go so ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, greetings to other co colleagues. Uh, thanks to Joy for the invitation. We are very appreciated for the invitation. Uh, for to for this opportunity to introduce our job, uh, the topic is the three-dimensional topology optimization of the thermal fluid structural problems for the cooling system design and the many journey from the Dalian University of Technology, and this is the main contents. Uh, we all know that this uh, the liquid cool heat sink has outstanding cooling ability and it has been used in many advanced areas. And uh, many uh, researchers have adopted topology optimization technique for uh, improving the cooling performance. Uh, the method can be the density-based method, the level set, MMC, and the simulation method can be the finite element, finite volume, boundary element, and the less bottom method. So here is the motivation of our job. Uh, in, some, in some applications, uh, the cooling device is expected to be with some uh, load-bearing ability, such as the injection mode. They actually need enough stiffness to, to resist the uh, uh, clamping force. Uh, uh, furthermore, uh, considering the mechanical behavior uh, in the top division can be used to avoid some unrealistic, unrealistic design. Uh, for example, if you're only considering your cooling performance, you may get some uh, solid regions uh, floating in the fluid, fluid which is actually uh, obviously improper. Uh, in addition, we also uh, observe some interesting results in our tests, uh, which is uh, it implies that the choice of density numbers should be more careful in the fluid thermal problem rather than the pure fluid problem. So let's see the basic methods. Uh, here we use the simplest assumptions of the laminar flow, Newtonian fluid, and we don't consider the effect of, of the with cost dissipations. Uh, here is the uh, schematic diagram. Uh, the boundary condition is that uh, in the inlet, the fluid uh, has the constant uh, temperature and the velocity, and on the outlet, uh, that the pressure is zero. Then we use the surface load to consider the mechanical property of the structure. 
Uh, then this is the government equations. Uh, we first saw the never stocks equations to obtain the velocities, then substituting the velocities for the energy equations, we can calculate the temperature. And in the end, we can use this, uh, we can, with this temperature, we can consider the, the effect of thermal expansions in the mechanical equations. Uh, we basically used a uh, ba uh, density based method. Uh, his gamma means the pseudo density, and the zero means the solid, one means the fluid. And uh, like uh, other works, we use these densities to control these inverse probabilities. Uh, like here, like this, this alpha max means the actually means the inverse probability in the solid, and it should be very large. Then it can be used to punish the velocity to zero in the Navier Stokes equations. Uh, we also use the same interpretation technique on the other material properties like the heat conductivity and the elastic modulus. Uh, here is the opposition model. Uh, basically, the objective is the mean temperature and the constraints includes the power dissipation, volume of the fluid, and the deformation of the structure. The sensitivities are calculated by solving the continuous adjoint equations. Okay, this equation are actually very uh, complex. I didn't present them here. You can find them in our paper. And uh, we solve these equations uh, with the open form. Actually, we also use the pair computer technique. We actually, uh, in our test, we always use the 20 processors. Uh, we have uploaded our code to the GitHub. Uh, you can download it if you are interested. So uh, then now we can see some result. So when we first finished the code, uh, we first performed the pure fluid thermal design. That means that the deformation is not considered here. We only considered the, the constraint of power dissipations and the volume. Then this is the model we used for the test. Uh, it's like a box shape and uh, here is the limit and the outer is in the other sides. Uh, considering the symmetry, we used a quarter symmetric model as this green part, uh, the materials are the water and aluminum. Uh, we also applied a uniform heat source in the whole domain. Uh, as I mentioned about, this uh, from X means the inverse permeability in the solid, in the solid. And uh, uh, it is actually a very important parameter for the topology optimization of, of the fluid. And it is usually estimated, estimated with this formula. Here, the eta means the viscosity of, of the fluid, and L means the characteristic length of the design domain, and the DA means the dusty number. Uh, in most cases, the dusty number is given based on the experience. Therefore, we set the dust number with different values like this. Then this is the density field during the whole optimization process. Uh, something interesting, we can see that uh, when the density number is higher, we can see uh, at the end of the optimization, some fluid, some wall-like structures of fluid are formed. Uh, in fact, at the very beginning, we didn't try this value. We didn't try this value because uh, we, uh, this, uh, too low value of density number may cause the converging problems. Therefore, we only used these two values. These two values actually have been well used in, in other applications. Therefore, when I see this result, I was expected because I thought maybe I got something new. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, when I see the uh, distribution of the temp temperature, uh, I can I know that this result. I realize this result are actually not good. You can see this uh, this fluid walls are actually uh, divide this uh, whole design domains have to design domain and each design domain is which uh, almost the uniform temperature distribution. Then that's the problem because we know that in the solid the heat moves by the heat conduction. And the heat conduction was driven by the temperature gradient. So therefore, if the temperature is uh, uniform, uh, that then the temperature gradient, gradient must be very low. And so is the heat conduction. Uh, but we're still wondering why these walls are formed. So we do some further investigation. Then here we define this F as the proportion of the heat conduction in the totally heat movement. Uh, here, this is the heat conduction and this is the heat convection. 
and this n means the directions from inlet to outlet like this black arrow. Then we know that the F should be zero, actually not be zero, but should be very small in the fluid because uh, we, know, we know that in the fluid, the convection is really much higher than the conduction. And on the contrary, uh, on the contrary, in the solid region, since the velocity should be zero, actually is not is actually very small. Then means that the convection should also be zero. Then the F should be equal one. Then we investigate the, we check the values of F on these cross sections uh, of uh, like this uh, marked with this uh, echo like cut this cut apart like the cross section uh, marked with the dotted lines. Then here is the result. Uh, these three are the pseudo density field and the cross sections. The red part, the, the red part means the fluid, and this part, this this three are the proportion of the heat conductions. Now we can see some uh, gray area here, here, like here, here. Uh, if like uh, uh, this gray area actually means that in these solid regions, the heat conduction didn't play a dominant role. Uh, but, but in fact, in this gray area, the heat conduction is still higher than the convection, but their values are basically on the same level. <clears throat> that means that the effect of the heat convection on the result in the solid cannot be elected. elected. And with the lowest value of that number, since the velocity has been uh, harder punished, we can got a pure black and white picture. Like this, uh, this is actually what we want. So now we see the we see the heat convection has, still has a uh, effect, non neglectful effect. Therefore, we saw that maybe the velocity has not been well punished. Then we plot this uh, uh, the regions of the velocity where uh, the velocity is higher than the one percent than one percent of the inlet velocities. Then we got these two pictures. We can see this fluid. This is the fluid regions. We can see this fluid region actually uh, matches the <clears throat> density field. Therefore, uh, we can say the velocity has, has been well punished. But then we can make some conclusions. Uh, we used to believe that if we can, if we have punished the velocity to a small value, then the corrections will be much lower than the conduction in the solid region. But actually, the result shows that that's not true because these two terms are naturally not on the same magnitude. Uh, also, these two terms, uh, these two terms are related to the many other uh, properties of the material. Uh, it I also mean, means I that. Can. It also means that uh, the thermal, uh, in the thermal fluid of topology optimization, we expected a better estimation for the FRMX than the other one, since the other one is simply for the pure fluid problem. Uh, so the thermal properties in the new one, the thermal properties must be considered. Then in the rest test, we always set this the lowest value of this number. Also, we can uh, infer that these wall-like structures are actually meant to take this hot fluid from the solid, just like these solar panels absorbing the sunlight. Uh, let's see the result uh, of the fluid thermal structure design. We still use the same, same model. Uh, the only difference is we applied a uh, uniform pressures on the topic. The total force is here, and we will consider the deformation constraint. And uh, also this uh, mechanical equation, this red part is the summary expansion term. If we don't consider the, the summary expansion, we can set, it, set them as zero. Uh, here is the result when we do not consider summary expansions. And uh, this is two results are under different deformation constraints. And in the lower one, the constraint is stricter. Uh, to show more details, uh, I, I plot the uh, that's the field on the three cross sections like this, uh, like marked with the dotted line. Uh, we can see that uh, when the constraint is stricter, the cross section of channels are actually in the a more vertical, which is a parallel to the directions of the external force. And this structure uh, pro can provide a higher stiffness. stiffness. Uh, but when we further consider, consider the effect of thermal expansions, we got a uh, quite a different uh, we got a quite a different uh, result.
Uh, so I also saw the cross sections of the, of the density field. Uh, actually, uh, in this problem, in this in this test, this, the displacements caused by the thermal expansion and the external load are actually on the opposite directions. Therefore, in the opposite results, uh, they are actually meant to reduce the stiffness, then the deformations of the two regions can be neutralized. You can see, you can see a lot of horizontal uh, cross sections of channels. Uh, this result actually, this uh, structure actually bad for the, for the stiffness. And in addition, we can also see some isolated fluid regions here. We all know that this isolated fluid region have zero contribution to the cooling performance. Therefore, there is these things only meant to reduce the stiffness. Uh, here is the conclusion. We performed the fluid thermal structural topology optimizations uh, with the uh, uh, with uh, uh, analog analytical adjoint equations, and they are solved with the open form. We also discussed the structural features of the results of diff with different cases. Uh, we believe these approaches can be further extended to avoid the floating solid result if we consider the effect of weight. Uh, in, in this work, we didn't do that. Also, in, also, if the thermal stress in the, we actually, we actually have met this kind of problem. If thermal stress is a matter of issue, we can also use this, uh, use this approach on that. In the end, our result shows that the, in the fluid thermal problem, the velocity should be punished harder than the pure fluid problem. Uh, therefore, this is meant to eliminate the effect of the heat convection in the solid. Then it also means that a more appropriate formula for estimating the FMX for the three-dimensional thermal fluid problem is effective. Uh, this formula should be able to eliminate eliminate the thermal convections in the solid. Therefore, it should it should be also to, to uh, determine by the more uh, properties like the material densities, heat conductivity, the capacity, and the characteristic velocities. These quantities are actually appears in the energy equations. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Great, thanks, thanks a lot, thanks for, your a lot for your presentation. So, so do, we do we have any questions, have any from, questions from the audience? From the audience? Uh, any hands? Nope. No written? No written. Okay. okay, I have a few questions. So when you... Uh, <laughs> so you insert... So you insert... Oh, sorry? Oh, sorry. So, was it just myself? Was it just myself? The joy I hear... The joy I hear... Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a so hand up now. Hand so up let's go so to Shengda Yao. Shen da Yao. Uh, uh, so my question, so is, my question uh, is, uh, may I know the, I know the uh, initial design for your organization? How you set your in the initial design? Uh, it's actually it's like the with the zero density is equal the uh equal the ratio of the volume uh, volume constraint. I didn't saw the constraint initial designs here because in the three dimensions you can I cannot say show this uh, pictures of this uh, value. This uh, this is this pictures are only the when the zero density is higher than the zero point five. Okay. Yeah. So, so I have a question. Is, uh, like, uh, specific initial design. What? I mean, the initial design is not like a pure fluid or like a uniform porosity distribution. Uh, uniform, uniform. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, so the I, next question. Yeah, I have Mitch? a question, but I see for some reason I cannot find the race hand thing. So sorry for that, but uh, thank you for a very nice presentation, Xingli. I'm kind of curious. So, as I, if I understand it correct, you are using a finite volume to method to solve a steady state elasticity problem. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And I've never tried that. So, could you, could you, what is your experience with doing that? How does it compare to uh, the implementation? Uh, we just use it to solve the mechanical equations. And we actually have used it on the, some benchmark result, like the MBB beam. That, that the result seems okay. Okay. 
good to hear. So it's what if you compare timing and stuff like this, how does that perform? Uh, no, uh, but uh, I think that the finite volume is not good at, at this mechanical uh, problem, but uh, we use this the uh, open form, so we don't want to try the other software. Okay, well, thank you. Very interesting. All right, so we have a question from Xi Cheng Sun. Uh, I have a question for, uh, can you go to where you compare the convection and the conduction ratio? Uh, I think you, 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 uh, uh, you I, here, here. yes, this page, I think you, yeah. You, you, yeah. you said you see a lot of this structure because the high Darcy number, right? Because Darcy number is not low enough. Other, can you just add a penalty to the convection term in the governing equation instead of use no Darcy number? Can that be done? Uh, yes, that's a good question. We actually used to try that. We uh, we used the uh, uh, the densities uh, with a multiple density to the convex term. Then the convection term will should be vanished in the solid. But uh, when we do that, uh, uh, solving the equations, the program collapse. We're still working on that. I see. Uh, other is like could this problem be also because of the mesh arrays are not fine enough. So maybe the boundary layer or something else for this problem. Uh, I didn't really thought of that, but uh, we actually used a very um, density dentist mesh. Uh, we actually used a 20, uh, actually a lot of mesh here. Uh, we, uh, we do use the pair computing to deal with it. But uh, we, uh, we, we actually didn't think of, about, about that before. Okay. okay, thank you. All right, great. Thanks. So that's all for now. So let's thank Li Sheng again. And then we will go on to the next presenter okay. with Caspar uh, Andreessen. So we just share the screen. We just need to unmute. And there you go. All right, go ahead. Yes, so thank you, Joe, for the introduction. So uh, this is a talk on the topology optimization of two fluid heat exchangers. So it's a work done primarily by two former master students, Lucas Höher and Daniel Nerhau, but um, with Joe, Ole, and myself on the side, supervising, giving good advice. And um, we will see if we are actually able to shift. Yes, so uh, motivating for uh, the topology optimization of a two fluid heat exchange design, then uh, we would like to be able to design heat exchangers like this, for instance, where there's a parallel flow. So we have a clear separation of one fluid and another one can flow around it. So that is intrinsically prob problematic in two dimensions. But of course, we can think of three dimensional situations where that is working just fine. So we could think of shell and tube heat exchangers where you have one fluid flowing in a set of pipes. There might be some baffles in between, and then you would have a surrounding fluid that can then either cool or heat the flow in the pipes. But it is, uh, of course, very important that you have a well-separated design such that the fluids are not mixed. This could also be the case in a cross-flow heat exchanger, as we see on the right here, where you would typically have a set of plates that are then uh, concatenated and uh, alternatively uh, pushing the cold and hot fluid up and down, but still separating the fluids at all times. So uh, in order to, uh, to obtain such a situation in topology optimization, we need to be sure that we can identify the interface. So this is done by uh, utilizing the works that I've written down below in the right corner here, that uh, there are some inspiring works on, on doing uh, coded structures, and it was further refined in the paper on shell infrastructures, but here it's used in a heat exchanger context. So basically by using a set of filter operations, so we have the design filter here shown in black, filter the design, then we get a grayscale. We can then project it to make sure that uh, 
we have a well-projected design. Then we filter it again to make sure that there is a gradient, and then we do an offset. So we, in contrary to the most uh, heavy side projection filtering, where we might uh, realize that ether equal to uh, 0 0.5, we do it at two different values, which gives us either this well separated uh, fluid channels, as seen in blue here, and then you can get the part that is the wall down in. But this is also tried to be illustrated here on the right, where we see that we have a design variable that for this case is just a gradient. If we fill the gradient, it will still be a gradient. But as we increase the beta projection, we can actually get a well-defined interface that is then projected with an offset to get either fluid number one, fluid number two, or a wall. So uh, for this filtering process, we utilize the PTE filter. and uh, we use the smooth heavy side, and then it's of course important to choose the right parameters. They can be found in the paper by Lou et al. And uh, here we are guaranteeing a wall thickness WE that we can get by utilizing a different or a specified ether projection threshold. And uh, in this case, we use 0 0.05 and 0 0.95, and then we get a value of the wall thickness that corresponds to uh, the radius in the last filter divided by 0 0.75. So in this way, we can at all times guarantee that uh, we have a well identifiable wall as soon as the projection is uh, increased enough. So I'll try to illustrate it here. So um, if we see that we would like to have a, a, a an oscillating wall, so it could be a design field that looks like this. Then we would apply the aforementioned procedure, and we can get an interface representation, so we would call the wall. Then if uh, we then designate it as uh, two separate fluid phases and the wall being the white one here, we can see that we are in this zoom that we're actually able to get the predefined the thickness of the wall. So in this case, I chose uh, for approximately four elements. And then, of course, since you, we use uh, constant density elements, then uh, based on how you do the th exact thresholding, you might get uh, four or five elements in the thickness. So here it's a bit over-exaggerated, of course. So um, if we look into how this we then parameterize the physics. Then we use uh, two fluid domains because we would like to represent two fluids and a single wall. So each of the fluids are represented in the entire domain and uh, they will be separated by a solid wall using the minimum thickness as uh, shown before, using this erosion dilation based approach. So it also means that we solve the full Navier-Stokes or steady state Navier-Stokes equations for two fluids in the entire domain it means that in every node here, we have a set of uh, fluid degrees of freedom for each of the fluids. And then in addition to this, one set for the convection diffusion problem, so that is the temperature. So it means that we have four degrees of freedom for in each node for one fluid, four for the other, and then one for the temperature, making it up to total nine degrees of freedom per node. Of course, uh, since the problem is weakly covered, we don't need to solve the system for all equations at the same time. So um, if we look at the design problem here, we see that we have an inlet in the bottom uh, uh, left side here, where there's a hot fluid coming in, and there's a opening here for the hot fluid that can get out. So the hot fluid only sees this opening over here and also sees only this inlet here. For the cold fluid, we see an outlet to the left and an inlet to the right. There's a prescribed interface uh, region where, where there's not able to do any design in order to avoid uh, exploiting boundary uh, condition representation. So it's only here in the green design domain that we can actually uh, optimize the design. We also see that the inlet temperature of the hot fluid is one and the inlet temperature of the cold fluid is zero. So the system solved here is a non-dimensionalized, incompressible steady state, Navier-Stokes, 
with the Brinkman penalization term, as we just saw before also. So uh, it means that uh, in the front of the viscous term, we have this uh, one over the Reynolds number, and the Reynolds number is defined like we see up here. There's also the peglet number. In this case, we have defined a solid peglet number, which is the leading term for the convection term in the convection diffusion equation. By non-dimensionalizing using uh, the solid peglet number here, we can avoid interpolating both the leading term of the convective uh, part and also in the diffusive part of the convection diffusion equation. So by this, we can uh, utilize only a single interpolation scheme for the CK value. So the CK value is the ratio of the fluid's conductivity with respect to the solid conductivity. So um, it means that in um, in the so in the fluid we have a low conductivity, so that would be this uh, CK value here. Typically, the fluid has a uh, conductivity that are multiple magnitudes lower than, or possibly multiple magnitudes lower than the solid, and we would have a high conductivity in the solid material. Then, if we look at the optimization problem, then we see that uh, the objective function that we have designed for this problem is to maximize the heat transferred from the cooled to the coolant fluid. So basically we look at what is the enthalpy that is going out of the domain, and then that is uh, of course a good thing to get that down because it means that the enthalpy that is entering the domain has been, the hot side has been transferred to the cold side. So we want to minimize the first term here, and then likewise we would like to increase the size of the enthalpy that is getting out, so therefore we add this with the minus in front in order to get the in an increase in the enthalpy out. So basically it's two times the same thing, but we will uh, we'll then ensure that they are behaving well on both sides of the domain. Then in order to ensure that uh, we don't just get a large sponge of, uh, of, of dense material, which is doing a very good heat transfer job, but uh, a bit unrealistic, one could say, then we have constraints on the pressure drop. So these are formulated uh, based on a reference pressure drop that could be the open channel, for instance. Then we also have interpolation, so we use a RAM scheme for the Brinkman penalization factor, and then a multi-material simp kind of scheme for the for the conductivity. It is a bit tricky to find a suitable setting for the power exponent here, but one should of course ensure that the things are, are converting in a monotonously fashion. But uh, studies right, have performed that before. So. If we look at the results in 2D, we can here see how we optimize the structure in a 2D setting, which is not that interesting because there are not many opportunities for increasing the heat transfer. Basically, we just get narrow channels. If we look at the, how we are optimizing, we see that there are several steps that is due to the continuation in the beta parameter. We have verified the implementation towards an analytical optimal estimate on uh, on the heat transfer and basically we see that we can we can be a bit better that is because the analytical estimate cannot make a curved channel so now to the more interesting three dimensional part here where we optimize a shell and heat and tube heat exchanger so we get the hot oil in and uh, it is uh, flowing around the pipes and getting out and uh, likewise there's a cold fluid entering and flowing in some pipes so in this baseline design the thing is now that we have uh, oil and water and stainless steel, and then we would like to make an optimized heat exchanger using the same pressure drop. And uh, this is doable, and in this case, we solve a system uh, with uh, approximately 12 million degrees of freedom for each of the Navy Stokes systems, and then uh, 3 million degrees of freedom for the convection diffusion. It takes like 7 to 15 hours on 320 cores if we use maximum 350 design iterations. In this case, we have approximately uh, five and a half elements width of the wall. If we look at the render design, we see uh, appendices added to the main channels of the heat exchanger, and they are extending the surfaces such that we get very good uh, heat transport. It's of course a property of the materials chosen here, so due to the very large uh, conductivity of the solid material, uh, it is a good thing to uh, add these appendices or micro-release 
we get an improvement with respect to the base design of 113%, so that means performance is 213% baseline design. If we look at the design details, we see that there's a, a flow that is intricate on the, each of these uh, small micro -release. We also see that uh, it's important, of course, to choose a proper uh, initial state of the design. If we choose just a uniform design, then uh, it is difficult to get the design to fill out the entire available volume. However, it's still an improvement in comparison to the baseline design. And if we initialize using a too strict uh, starting point, it's also poor performing because the design freedom is limited. So it's a good thing to try to see if you can find a suitable uh, flexible space in the design room. Yeah, if we lower the conductivity, we see that these appendices, they disappear. So basically we set the solid diffusivity to the coolant diffusivity and we see no, no appendices are formed and we just have a more serpentine-like design channel. If we increase the wall thickness, we also see that some of the micro wheels are disappearing due to the very thick walls here. Finally, we did some uh, thickness control to verify that the cross sections of the design actually fulfill the, the design requirement on the wall thickness, and that seems to be working on all right. Then, of course, inspired by the next speaker here, we tried to do another example. So uh, we have implemented a similar cross flow heat exchanger, and uh, we get nice intricate designs. However, it's a bit difficult to, to compare the performance, or at least we have not been successful in, in doing that yet, since we use uh, different metrics for the measuring the performance. But definitely, it seems also to be possible to uh, make a similar cross-flow heat exchanger design. Uh, you can look at the very intricate uh, flow patterns that are in the, in the cross-flow heat exchanger. Um, and if definitely, if we see look at the design in the to the left here, we see some islands of material, and that is there's no guarantee in the optimization formulation as it is to uh, avoid these uh, these uh, single island. So uh, if one needs to remove them, one can of course try to pick them out or impose some constraint that can uh, take care of these isolated features. Yeah. So in summary, we have a two fluids approach with a clear interface identification and there's no constraints needed in order to uh, ensure that the fluids are well separated. It's a bit uh, expensive, of course, and the 2D is optimization results, they correlate well with the analytical optimum and uh, we are definitely able to improve on the heat exchange. And we see these uh, extended surfaces, uh, micro wheelies that appear, appear and, and as the uh, we adjust the rate of the of the conductivity, then we also see that they can disappear again. So uh, we see that it's also applicable to other methods or to other problems like cross flow heat exchangers. And, uh, and so far, we have limited the uh, the uh, solution to laminar flow, but uh, there should be no strict limitation in that. Yeah. With that, uh, this was uh, concluding the talk. Great. Thanks a lot. So do we have any questions from the audience? We have one from Florian already. Uh, thank you. Thanks you, Casper, uh, for this very interesting uh, presentation and, uh, and the last uh, results. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, have I understood well if I'm, I'm saying that your method is not able to create solid walls of greater thickness than uh, the prescribed thickness? Yeah. Um, you are right on that. So uh, we have been working on another form, or we are working on another formulation where that could be a possibility. But um, it is true that it's uh, it would have troubles in uh, in doing anything that has another size than uh, than the prescribed, which is of course a, a problematic thing. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right. So we also have a question: Is it using finite elements? Yes, it is using finite elements. So basically, it relies on on Joe's uh, 3D natural convection paper code. So uh, PETSI based with multigrid precondition and flexible GMRS. Yeah. 
Do we have any other questions? Oh, something happened. Yeah, we have a question. So I'll just read it up here. The initial value of the design variable is 0 0.5. Did you try some other initial values like 0 0.4 or 0 0.6? Will those values make the two fluid channels asymmetric? Yeah. So, um, I mean, based on on the experience, then uh, using a grayscale design it doesn't really make a lot of difference because it it is uh, performing well in terms of uh, heat transfer because everything is is totally inter intermingled so it doesn't make too much of a difference when the beta value is low so therefore i i did not we did not try 0 0.4 0 0.6 but it makes the same thing that everything is uh, is not well separated only when the beta value is increased to about to about a uh, four you can see a clear separation and that is when it's actually making a difference right having said that then it's of course important that uh, that uh, it has some that the optimization uh, algorithm has some freedom to move around, otherwise it's difficult to call it a topology optimization if, if it would be very strict on only deforming the, the surfaces. So uh, so I don't think it will make a lot of difference. It makes a difference what sort of uh, initial structure you put in. That is at least the conclusions from the 3D design here, the way you see in the top figure that it's not able to utilize the full domain because simply there was no information on flow in that region since the initial design didn't have a flow there. So that is a limitation on, on how this is formulated. All right, great, thanks. So let's thank you, Kaspar, again here. And then we move on to the last speaker. So Florian, if you go ahead and share your screen. And unmute yourself so we can hear you. Perfect. Oh, now you're back. There we go. Okay, everyone is hearing. Okay, yeah. thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, webinar. Uh, so I'm going to present my work on body fitted topology optimization of 2D and 3D fluid to fluid detect changers. Uh, it was a uh, work done uh, during my PhD uh, under the supervision with Grégoire Allaire and uh, other people from uh, Safran Tech. And uh, also part of it uh, has been done uh, during the, through a short postdoc after the, the PhD. So the problem at hand is, to, is similar to uh, the problem that Casper just treated. Uh, we consider the stru solid structure uh, omega s in gray, in which uh, we have two phases of uh, fluids, one hot phase and one cold phase. And uh, we want, so it's a heat exchanger, and we, we want to find the shape of the of both phases such that the heat transferred from the hot fluid to the cold fluid is maximized. So we can uh, think of several configurations, so whether we have a cross flow or counter flow. Um, and um, so this is the problem at hand. And uh, so we consider Navistox flows in the hot and cold phase. Um, we consider thermal convection in the fluid phases, so there is transport of heat, and there is also thermal diffusion in both the fluid phases and the solid phase. And uh, to be, uh, as, it, as it is the case in, in, in physical systems, the conductivity of the solid is much greater than the conductivity in the fluid phase. Uh, so K, the, the KS is greater than KF, and uh, it has some importance in the final design that we obtain. Uh, and there is, uh, so the most important constraint, maybe the most difficult to deal with, is the non-penetration constraint. Um, so we, uh, we, we are going to rely on, on a completely geometric uh, a description of the, of, the, of the shape. So we are going to use a bony fitted approach in which we will have access to the geometry of the fluid uh, at every iteration. And so the, the way we have chosen to implement this non-penetration constraint is to in enforce a distance constraint between the two phases. So we will, we will try to enforce that there is a distance, uh, the distance to the blue boundary to the red boundary is greater than a, a threshold D min. So we will enforce the minimum wall thickness D min, but uh, this wall thickness can be, uh, is allowed to take greater values actually. And uh, we also want to, uh, to solve all this problem in 3D. 
Um, so contrary to the, the three previous presentations, so uh, we consider the boundary variation method of Hadamard. So we don't use a density-based approach. We use uh, an approach in which the design uh, field is the boundary of the interface between the fluid and the solid. Um, and uh, we compute sensitivities with respect to small variations of this boundary. So we consider the vector fields uh, theta uh, uh, on the boundary, and uh, we, we are able, with the use of shape gradients, to compute asymptotics with respect to small variations. And, uh, and uh, by the, the shape gradients tells, tells us how to uh, update the boundary uh, to, uh, to improve the, the design iteratively. So the, um, the, the outcome of the, of the talk is the heat exchangers, but uh, in order to, to be able to obtain this, um, to solve this problem, um, the, the, this problem is the result of several ingredients that I developed during my PhD. And so I'm going to try to present very, very briefly uh, um, a bit of each of the ingredients. And uh, then I can come back to during the questions if you, if you want more details. So the, the first ingredient was to, 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 use, to use compute shape derivatives, so to in, in a, the sensitivities with respect to variations of the shape. Um, there was the, then I had to develop, uh, we had to rely on, a, on a efficient uh, algorithms suitable for the level set method um, in this context. Then in order to treat uh, 3D problems, I had to use a parallel computing. And then in the, in the last part, uh, we needed to um, to use a, 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 some recent technique in order to treat the geometric constraints, so the distance between the two um, the two fluid phases. And so all these ingredients together together uh, allowed us to solve the final the heat exchanger problem in three D. So let's say a word about shape derivatives first. So the the system so the so in order to be more precise regarding the physics, so we have a fluid phase and a solid phase, and the equation, the physics equations that I'm going, that we are solving are the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations, the convection diffusion. So very standard. Uh, it's exactly the same as the previous one. But since we are using a body fitted approach, we don't need to use a Brinkman penalization term. Uh, we solve the this physic these physical equations exactly without modifying the without using any interpolation scheme. We uh, have we are we have we are able to compute shape derivatives of arbitrary cost functions. So it's not a, uh, so you, we have some formula, this kind of formula somewhere in in the code, uh, which which uh, allows us to compute shape derivatives of arbitrary functional and so sensitivities with respect to uh, uh, the variation of the shape are known for for arbitrary functionals. So I refer to this reference. Uh, for further uh, in, information about that. And then, so we rely on body fitted meshes. So it's a technique uh, which is used since the work of uh, Allaire and Daponi and Frey. Um, it, so it allows us to capture the interface between the fluid and solid exactly. So no need of physics interpolation, no porous regions. And so the, the idea of the of technique is that once we, are, we have computed um, a, def a shape deformation, which is given in the form of a vector field known, known as the mesh nodes. Um, we, 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 we solve a level set equation in order to update to on the fixed mesh the, the, the localization of the boundary. And then we use the remeshing software MMG to discretize this boundary and then uh, to remesh it uh, in order to have a high quality mesh. So the, um, the nice thing with MMG is that you, we, we are able to implement uh, local, uh, specific local size constraints. Uh, we, we, can info, we can very tune very finely the, the mesh size uh, around the boundary of the, of the, of the interface. And um, we are also able, so it allows us to capture sometimes some designs which could be difficult to capture with density-based methods because uh, we can mesh very finely uh, at some parts of the design and more costly far from the boundary. So this is the kind of design that we obtain from uh, mechani mechanical structures. And uh, we are really that the, the optimization is giving us uh, plates instead of bars, uh, with, and which is, which, is a, which is a result because uh, we, we used this kind of remeshing technique. So then uh, once we have these shape derivatives, we needed uh, 
an efficient optimization algorithm. So again, I, I'm not going into the details, but it's just to mention that uh, we have a systematic way to solve nonlinear constraint optimization problems on manifolds with a moderate number of constraints. Um, so this is very suitable for the level set method uh, because usually we, we don't have, as in the density method, we don't need to enforce the local constraints that the, the, the design variable should be between zero and one. Uh, we only have the physical uh, constraints. And, um, and so this algorithm is, is taking care of the Hilbert structure of uh, shape derivatives and uh, so the infinite dimensional context. So there is a, an implementation that is freely available and there is also a paper that you can check if you are interested. So uh, briefly, it's the generalization of uh, an unconstrained gradient flow. Uh, and because we are, we are solving an ODE to, to, to solve optimization problem, we don't need to tune too much uh, algorithm parameters. Okay. So uh, then a word about parallel computing, uh, which so we, in order to treat 3D problems, we used uh, domain decomposition and adapted preconditioners for solving finite element problems. So we are able to achieve all finite element uh, method related operations in parallel. Uh, so there is a paper about that also, uh, where we solved a few uh, uh, th three physics uh, topology optimization problem. And uh, this allowed it to solve uh, fluid problems on meshes up to 4.8 uh, millions of these tetrahedrons uh, with uh, 30 CPUs. Uh, so right now, the mesh adaptation and the isosurface discretization is still sequential, and it is taking a huge part of the computational cost, actually. Uh, but uh, future release uh, of uh, NMG uh, will probably allow to do it in parallel. So there are people working on, uh, on making this uh, parallel. Okay, so now uh, I come to the last ingredient, which is the most uh, yeah, the most important one, which is the treatment of the geometric constraints. Uh, so we want to enforce the, this, the minimum distance between the two phases. And uh, so we, we are going to enforce it by imposing at the distance, the sign distance function from the hot domain to the core domain is greater than, than a threshold dimming. So, D, so we, we impose it, we consider this pointwise constraint actually at the beginning, which tells that for every point of on the hot domain, the distance to the core domain is greater than dimming. So I recall just uh, the side distance function, it's the function that tells you the distance uh, that is plus the distance to the boundary if we are if you are outside the domain and minus the distance if you are inside. And uh, so by uh, by uh, considering this, we can recast the heat exchanger problem. Uh, we can formulate it like this. So we want to minimize the to maximize the heat transferred, which corresponds to minimize some quantity which is here, which is uh, analogous to the one presented before. And there are some pressure drop constraints and the constraint on the on the on the distance. And uh, in order to treat this point one constraints, you introduce an average functional uh, which depends on the sign distance function. And so we approximate the L infinity norm by a LP norm, which is a uh, very classical. And so the, the 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 technical part was to be able to compute the shape derivative of this kind of constraints. And so um, the previous works uh, from Aller, Jouve, and Michaelidis have shown that you can actually, there is a formula to do this, but this formula is not very convenient because it requires to, to integrate along the rays uh, on the mesh discretization. So for each point of the boundary, you have to compute these rays, and you have also to compute curvatures of the shape, and this is not very convenient. And so in a, one of uh, the, the, my works, uh, we were able to show that uh, you can actually compute this, uh, this solution by solving a variational problem. And so you, we solve just a variational problem with finite elements, and this is as easy to implement in 2D and in 3D, and this allows us to handle the geometric constraints. Okay, so finally I come to the results. Um, so we solve the problem in 2D uh, first, and uh, the, so this is, a, we consider two tubes, and this is a counter flow uh, um, problem. And we see that the design is, is making uh, serpentine uh, uh, channels. And so we, we retrieve uh, results which were analogous to uh, the seminal thesis from uh, Papazoglu 
which is one of the first work on the heat exchangers. So this, these are some, uh, some pictures of the design. And so then now we, we wanted to solve it in uh, 3D. And so we consider this, uh, this box um, where we have one flow coming from the left of the cube and a hot flow coming from the bottom. And uh, we want to impose this, this minimum distance constraint between the two channels. And uh, so here, one of the uh, features of the level set method is that we have to uh, propose an initial design. And so in 3D, there is quite uh, some freedom uh, regarding the initial topology of the, of the channels. And so we chose to, uh, to create an array of pipes, an intricated array of pipes, where we ensure that uh, there, there are actually two uh, distinct phases. And then we let the optimizer uh, modify uh, this shape, and so topology changes can happen. So this is a, 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 yeah, a plot of uh, uh, one topology optimization of the, of the system, and you see a cut. And so you see that at every iteration, the minimum distance constraint is well uh, respected. And also the, the wall thickness uh, is, uh, is exactly deeming at some parts of it, but there are some other parts uh, of the design where it's not exactly the case, actually. So th this is another example where the wall thickness is uh, sm slightly lower and uh, you have uh, you see another color to see that both phases remain well separated during the design process. And so the, these are a few intermediate iterations. Uh, you see that we have also a, a fluid plates like uh, in the previous design. And uh, this is a plot of the both uh, phases uh, for the configuration and the cut of the resulting uh, solid domain. So this is the end of my talk and uh, many thanks for listening uh, to me. Great, thanks a lot. So do we have any questions from the audience? We have one. So do you have to compute the sign distance field? And if so, how do you do it? Yes, uh, we have to compute it. So at every iteration, um, whenever we update the design, we compute it. And uh, so we use uh, a software, uh, open source software called the MSH dist, um, which you use a fast marching method uh, on, the, on the triangulated mesh or tetrahedral mesh to compute uh, the sign distance function from a, uh, a mesh in which you know you have a subdomain uh, that is already uh, meshed. Okay, thanks. So we have a question. Can you comment on the performance, please? So I don't know if that's the computational performance or the... Uh, yes, so, um, so for, for this example, the last example that I've shown, uh, so the, I think the computational costs are comparable to uh, what has been presented before. So we, have, we, we use 30 CPUs. Um, it took us about 10 to 15 days to, to compute, the, to solve the whole optimization problem. So we do about uh, 300 iterations, three to 400 iterations, to be this order of uh, number of iterations needed to make sure that we have uh, converged. Um, even though the first, after the first 100 iterations, you already have good designs. And um, one for each iteration, uh, it costs, you, you need about uh, uh, one hour uh, to solve the finite element problem and to remesh, basically. So each one iteration is about one or one hour, something like that. But it's not the the cost of one iteration is does not remain constant because at the beginning the, the mesh was uh, as more had more elements than the, at the end. Okay, so if the person meant uh, physical performance, then what is your answer? Uh, okay. Um, really, so my, my answer is that um, so we have not. Uh, try to understand too much the, the physics of uh, why we obtain these shapes. Uh, so we, we just looked at the, the optimization histories and we saw that we are able to enforce the physical constraints while still uh, making the, the objective function to so the heat exchange the maximized. And uh, so we, we were happy with that. After we can just maybe make a comment about this uh, plate-like structures of the fluid. And so, um, so we recall that um, 
since the conductivity is much higher in the solid phase and much lower in the fluid phase, um, so this is something which has been observed, the optimization tries to use the fluid material as an insulating uh, material to, uh, to create uh, um, discontinuity if the, if, the term, term, if the temperature gradient. And so we, we think that the, this plate-like uh, uh, fluid channels um, are used to, uh, to, to create, uh, uh, to, to use this, this physical effect uh, of uh, preventing the heat uh, to transfer from one side to the other side. Okay, then we have a question. Uh, in the paper, there is a volume constraint. Is it needed? Yes, um, actually it's not needed. Um, we, we, we observe that when we enforce it, uh, we, the, the constraint uh, is uh, not saturated at the end, I think. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember exactly, but we just chose to, to enforce it to be sure that we have a, a, a balanced, um, the same amount of, of, of uh, mass in both the cold phase and the hot phase. We could have not decided to do so, uh, we, we, I, I don't remember, I, I don't remember right now if, uh, it is said in the play paper clearly whether the constraint at the end is saturated or not. We saw that it was saturated for at least uh, part of the, of the iterations, but it's not needed, but we just uh, did it in order to have, uh, yeah, well-balanced uh, design, but uh, it's, not, we, we could have decided uh, something else. Okay. Mm. So uh, we have a question here, I think uh, is interesting. So can you come on, comment on what motivated you to use slash develop the null space optimizer? Did you experience yes, issues uh, with other optimizers? So, so ba basically for the, um, for the level set method, uh, the other optimizers that are available, well, most often it's uh, the augmented Lagrangian methods that people have been using. Um, and uh, so the, the augmented Lagrangian method, I found it was very uh, not convenient to use because you need to spend a lot of time to tune the to tune the, the Lagrangian parameters. And so maybe there are there are some optimizers that do that well. Uh, but uh, for the for the level set method, we had to implement our own optimizer because we are not optimizing on the Euclidean space uh, R n. We cannot use already. Uh, uh, available optimizers to do that. We need to have an, an optimizer that handles the manifold structure. Um, so that's why I, that's why we, we, we developed the, this idea of the new space optimizer. If you look into the details, you see that in fact, the new space at every iteration, the new space optimizer is doing a, a, a step which looks like the uh, Lagrangian, uh, augmented Lagrangian step but which a clever chosen uh, multiplier and penalty parameter. So at the end, uh, even also we have, we have thought about uh, sequential linear programming and sequential quadratic programming. Uh, so it, it turns out that if you, if you chose well the norms and the, 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 the parameters that you use for, 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 to, to set um, the, the box constraint for the sequential uh, linear programming method, you find actually that both methods are equivalent. Okay, great, thanks. So uh, let's thank Florian again. And uh, that is all the time we had. I think I accidentally said we would have time at the end, but we don't. I counted wrong. So we have reached the end of today. And uh, I think it was four very interesting uh, presentations. I hope you agree. And then uh, I don't have anything more to say. So thanks for coming. So I don't know if the other guys wanna say something. Uh, for all the speakers, it would be very nice if you can share your slides with the, the audience. You can send me an email with the presentation and I will put it online. Um, and our next uh, session will be uh, organized by MU Siva from the University of San Paulo. It is scheduled for um, 25th of March, of March. Yeah, hope to see you there. And this concludes the session. Thank you for joining and uh, have a nice uh, day or evening or night. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.